Pan Pan Psychast. Part two, further analysis and discussion. So in that last section, David, we ended with speaking uh, a bit about moral philosophy. Um, I, I guess my, my question is, uh, what's motivating the transhumanist's goal? I think you're a, a form of utilitarian. Listeners will remember we had Peter Singer on the show, someone which I know you've debated and discussed these issues with before. Now, Peter Singer came on and told us how he moved from hedonistic utilitarian, you know, maximize um, happiness and pleasure, decrease suffering. And he moved to that from preference utilitarianism, which you mentioned last week as well, you know, maximize people's preferences on the whole. I believe you don't fall into either of these views. What kind of utilitarianism do you maintain to be true and, and why? Uh, technically, I'm a negative utilitarian, uh, mm. which sounds extremely uh, uninspiring. <laughs> uh, Buddhist sounds much mm. better. Uh, and so, yes, one might describe oneself as a technological Buddhist. Yes, essentially, if one is a negative utilitarian or Buddhist, one thinks that our overriding obligation is to minimize, prevent, ultimately uh, abolish all forms of suffering and that uh, this takes uh, precedence over uh, increasing happiness and well-being. Um, so yes, in, in, a, in a nutshell. There's a, there's a listener question here from uh, someone called Doesn't Matter from Germany. I don't believe that is the name. There is a law in Germany that prohibits you from having a name uh, which will hinder your future prospects. Um, so I don't think their name is, it doesn't matter. But they say, um, does David have any experience with meditation to share or an educated opinion on it? Listeners will remember, this is me now, uh, listeners will remember we had Robert Wright on the show, spoke to us about Buddhism and how meditation can alleviate us from, from suffering in the hedonic treadmill. Um, do you think that, you, know, you mentioned Buddhism might be a better way to describe it? Is the, is the Buddhist um, completely on board or is meditation going to alleviate this? Do we need, tran do we need transhumanism to, to do this? Um, meditation. Uh, yes, I had a, a good chat with uh, Robert. Uh, 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 meditation is very valuable for a minority of people. Uh, some people derive mixed benefits. Some people, sadly, particularly melancholic depressives, can find that meditation makes, if anything, their problems worse. So it's not mm -hmm. it's not a panacea. Unfortunately, mm. by itself, med uh, meditation doesn't uh, recalibrate the hedonic treadmill. Uh, uh, likewise, the, the the noble eightfold path, sadly, isn't going to uh, prevent the horrors of the food food chain. Mm. Um, from what we know of the historical Buddha, which admittedly isn't uh, a great deal, he seems to have been a pragmatist above uh, above all else. Mm. Uh, if it works, do it. And uh, if notionally Gautama Buddha were to be transported into the, the, the present and he were to learn about uh, Bi biotechnology, mm. genetic engineering. Uh, would he reproach? Would he reproach us for not following the eightfold path? No, he was cutting edge for his <laughs> uh, 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 for his for his mm. era. Um, uh, just an, another point. Um, <laughs> classical utilitarianism, hedonistic utilitarianism, is, is intuitively more. Uh, plausible than negative utilitarianism. Most people will give at least some moral weight uh, to uh, enhancing uh, well-being, uh, even at the price of some suffering. But classical utilitarianism has uh, an extremely uh, counterintuitive consequence, certainly in a uh, an era of advanced technology that if all that matters uh, is uh, replacing suffering with uh, with happiness, then should one launch a so-called utilitronium shockwave, mm -hmm. where utilitronium is matter and energy optimized for pure bliss, and the shockwave alludes to its velocity of propagation, which in theory could be almost uh, light speeds with uh, 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 with 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 AI. Um, 
does one want, and I think perhaps as a as a hedonistic utilitarian, one has to say yes. Does one essentially want to maximise raw bliss within our Hubble volume, mm. or can one settle for something which is more uh, conservative, which is life based on gradients of intelligent bliss? And so in that sense, uh, as a negative uh, utilitarian, um, uh, yes, one can settle for uh, life based on gradients of bliss, whereas to the classical utilitarian, that's not good enough. He, The classical utilitarian, he or she must press this notional button and allow advanced superintelligence to obliterate complex civilization with this all-consuming cosmic orgasm. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm oversimplifying here, um, but all ethical uh, systems have, if one probes them deeply, uh, extremely counterintuitive consequences. Right. Uh, that is an example of how classical utilitarianism is extremely counterintuitive too. I mean, another counterintuitive consequence, if one is a, a classical utilitarian, uh, is that, you know, imagine a, a genie uh, uh, offers you uh, uh, this, this enticing offer super exponential growth of my happiness at the mm. expense of exponential growth of your suffering. Now, if one is a, a utilitarian, one, one must, uh, other things to be equal, say yes, because after all, I'm going to be getting super exponential uh, uh, increase in my bliss mm. and your merely uh, uh, exponential increase in suffering. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not, this is not uh, re- realistic, of course, mm-hmm. but mm. I don't dismiss thought experiments like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're a way of testing uh, 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 a moral right. theory. And a lot of people reflexively, if you say you're a negative utilitarian, they say, ah, so you'd, you'd mm. destroy the world if, if, if mm. you could. Uh, and I'm candid. If there were a button, I would press it. But there oh, is wow. uh, the, the, there is no button, uh, and therefore we have to go through uh, yes, this immensely uh, complicated, time-consuming, challenging uh, route, which is uh, mm. uh, yes, to use biotechnology uh, AI mm. to get rid of suffering. So yeah, because when we were doing when we were reading. The book, etc. This is one of the concerns, and this is one of the general concerns about negative utilitarianism. If the idea is merely to pr- to minimise suffering, then how is it that we what we should do is go about raising hedonic set points? So the, the kind of converse example to the cosmic orgasm that you gave then is like, and this is what we talked about with um, in our live Q and A with some of our listeners a few weeks ago. Well, if we can, you know with CRISPR and things like this, change, you know, genetic code, etc. Why why do we not just dullen or make more dull all of our experiences and reactions, etc., to make us sort of like worm-like <laughs> creatures? And in this instance, all of suffering is reduced. Mm. On the whole, what we do is kind of regress, let's say, rather than advance, and then suffering is going down. Like yeah, Another thing you mentioned earlier was like antinatalism. Surely the real consequence of what we should do, like you just mentioned, is to be antinatalist or to remove all life rather than try and improve life, because that gets rid of suffering. Um, take something like disappointment. I mean, uh, uh-huh. uh, 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 if one is a negative utilitarian, one is committed to removing all forms of disappointment. Mm. Uh, yeah. One can have the functional analogues of disappointment, but not the actual raw feels. Uh, and if a particular policy option is such, for example, getting rid of all uh, 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 all unpleasant experience, but not replacing it with gradients of intelligent bliss, if you find this disappointing or troublesome, then other things being equal, it's not a negative utilitarian uh, 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 policy. Um, so yes, it, 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 it's. I mean, I, I should perhaps stress that no one need be uh, a utilitarian of any kind to think that we should get rid of 
uh, uh, suffering. And no one uh, listening now need, need feel in any in any way that you know to, signing up to the abolitionist project involves being a negative utilitarian right. or, or, or or anything like that. But uh, 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 personally, yeah. That's, that's but right. if we aren't negative utilitarians, how do we get so, for instance, to the removal of suffering? Because if I'm a classic sort of hedonic utilitarian. I can have lots of suffering in the world. I just need to make more pleasure. So I can still have people with manic lows. I just need to make sure that somewhere in the world there are twice as good manic highs, right? So it, it, there is no removal of suffering there. Um, Classical get... utilitarians do want to, of course, uh, 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 to, to get uh, rid of suffering. Uh, yeah. It's just the trade-offs they're prepared, they are prepared to, to to make mm. uh, mm-hmm. uh, so uh, I mean, so I'm, I'm going back to your, your your previous comment about anti antinatalism mm-hmm. yeah. now you might think uh, uh, that uh, if one is uh, a Buddhist or a, uh, uh, or a negative utilitarian uh, that one should be an antinatalist and I suppose yes, I'm a soft antinatalist. I wouldn't want to bring more suffering into the world. Mm. But by choosing not to have kids, all one is doing is, yeah, essentially is imposing uh, selection pressure in favour of of natalism. Mm-hmm. That uh, there is no way that we can uh, get rid of pain and suffering from the world by simply not choosing to have kids. You know, kind of the sort of the the, the Benatarian. Uh, hard extinctionist antinatalism mm-hmm. simply isn't going to work that there are too many uh, fanatical life lovers who believe that we have a duty uh, to go forth and multiply uh, yeah. and simply removing ourselves from the gene pool is not going to do it um, yeah. of course it's much much harder uh, mm-hmm. yes essentially genetically uh, editing our own source mm-hmm. code but the very nature of selection pressure is shortly going to change with this revolution of, of designer babies, the reproductive uh, revolution. And I think one can imagine uh, increasingly intense selection pressure uh, in favor of positive, happy, subjectively wonderful mm-hmm. traits. And mm-hmm. various traits that were adaptive on the African savanna are no longer mm-hmm. going to be so when uh, intelligent agents, prospective parents, are actually choosing the genetic makeup of their future kids in anticipation Mm -hmm. of the likely consequences of their decisions. So, although it is horrendously complicated, uh, and it's going to take, I suspect, centuries to come Mm -hmm. to pass, uh, uh, nonetheless, I, I do see the abolitionist project as sociologically feasible and not merely technologically feasible whereas mm. uh, antinatalism uh, sa- uh, uh, sadly I don't see it viable as a global strategy to the problem but of if suffering. if I can just press you yeah, on this so point though if you take uh, there's a listener question from Dan Rongganga just to, from South Africa who asked this point exactly saying if you what should be your antinatalism does it follow from negative utilitarianism I guess Greg's uh, the point Greg raised um, in the form you've responded to it, it works in that you know you can't people aren't going to be um, preferencing or on the whole choosing not to have children and so therefore antinatalism's unfeasible even though you would push the button if chance but rather than pushing for super happiness super intelligence super longevity they seem to be to me the consequence of classical utilitarianism because if you wanted to just remove suffering we could all take an injection that just numbs uh, add suffering and then but we don't get any extra play or numbs us completely we could just be worm people rolling around in the dirt or even um, more plausibly we could just fund all this money into nuclear weapons and then make the button which would stop life on it we should be building a big bomb and blowing this place to bits so nothing can exist again so why is it that the negative utilitarian should prefer the big bomb over the the three supers if if you catch my drift. I mean, it's, it's just that uh, one needs to consider not merely what is 
technically feasible, but what is sociologically realistic, right. not mm. just now, but in 50 and 150 years' time. And I think it is possible, in spite of the tremendous worldwide diversity of belief system and mm -hmm. belief systems and values, to construct some kind of global consensus for getting rid of involuntary suffering in favour of gradients of well-being. Right. Um, mm -hmm. If one, particularly, if one wants to sound particularly uh, responsible and conservative, one can cite the World Health Organization with its extremely radical definition of health. Health is a is a state of complete uh, mental, physical, and social well-being, and it's kind of founding constitution. Now that is incredibly radical. I mean, I per personally urge only uh, a, a gradients of in uh, of intelligent well-being. But uh, something like a, a definition of health as radical as that of the World Health Organization, I think in principle it is possible to uh, send it to the, uh, the population at large. Whereas uh, ideas that, uh, yes, that well, it's going to be possible to persuade everyone everywhere to, to stop having children, or that it's going to be possible uh, to uh, arrange some kind of doomsday device that sterilizes the mm. planet. I mean, it's, it's technically feasible, but it's not sociologically right, okay. feasible. You're not going to get everyone on board um, with blowing themselves up, but you can get everybody on board with reducing suffering. Maybe another... Um uh, question here was and it's okay, maybe the converse of that so you might say well look if we focus on suffering it gets us in this position where we should kind of completely deny life right you know by removing it all and we have some pragmatic solution that's well no we can't really do that so we come up with raising the kind of hedonic calculus but the, you, you might think the, the converse of this is like the kind of message that people take away from Nozick's pleasure machine you know, Anarchy State and Utopia, 1974, which is, well, in fact, we don't want to deny life or suffering. In fact, it seems like we want to sort of embrace it, right? So we're given the opportunity to get in the machine, and Nozick says no one takes the opportunity, and thereby no one, we shouldn't take a kind of hedonistic utilitarianism seriously, because he thinks, like, we lose a connection to reality, which he calls it. But other people kind of go, well, the connection to reality might be the kind of real suffering and highs and lows that you go through, right? So, you know, you've got to have, you've got to put up with the rain to get the rainbow. Um, so do, David, do you kind of envisage kind of uh, people objecting to transhumanist projects on this side? I'm, I imagine you've heard this quite a lot before. I, it's a couple of responses to Nozick's uh, pleasure machine argument. Um, you've probably come across, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name, possibly you you, you do De Beauregard's inverse uh, pleasure mm. machine argument, uh, <laughs> that if you ask people uh, if you were to learn that uh, everything, that your whole uh, life was based on a lie, that you were mm. a brain in a vat or, 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 mm. or something like that, uh, would you want to keep the status quo or would you want to, uh, uh, yes, take the blue pill to mix our, our metaphors yeah. <laughs> uh, again? Most people, it turns out that their real preference is for, uh, for, for status quo oh, bias. I, I think I'd take um, the blue pill. But... <laughs> Take me out. Uh, uh, yes, uh, but I think back once again to this idea of hedonic recalibration, that mm. in, if instead of trying to sell life based on maximum uh, uh, happiness, maximum bliss, one is giving people the option to ratchet up hedonic set mm. points and hedonic range, uh, Essentially, yes, it's it's it it, it it's win-win. It's not asking you to give up, give anything up. Uh, you can still be, you know, if you're a fanatical mm. uh, football. So this is a, you know, I was gonna, I often say trivial example, but if you're a fanatical football supporter, mm -hmm. it's not trivial. You can still. <laughs> fanatically support your mm -hmm. team um but in all manner of other uh, uh, kind of uh, academic p pursuits uh essentially it 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 isn't sacrificing ev uh, everything to live in in a pleasure machine mm. uh it's it's a really great example that actually isn't it? 
I, I wonder if listeners as well, I, I appreciate people tweeting or responding, you know, whether or not you'd rather live or an authentic existence that's closer to reality or one in which, you know, there's lots of pleasures and um, you're perhaps a world of illusion, but you have things that, that make you happy. We, our last episode was on Albert Camus. Uh, we've done lots of Simone de Beauvoir and Sartre and Kierkegaard. And there's this tension, isn't there, between living a life which uh, is real or an authentic and one which uh, I guess we... Do you think there's a tension between putting the set point up, David, and and living authentically, or do you think we can live just as authentically um, with a higher hedonic set point? I mean, I, I didn't enter into this because it would involve so many okay. issues. But uh, to, 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 no, sorry. I mean, but this idea of to what extent are are we plugged into the real yeah. world? I mean, a lot of people, even if they would dis- disavow the label, are naive realists or direct. Uh, realists, whereas if one has what I regard as a scientifically uh, viable uh, account of the nature of perception, each of us is running a, a world simulation. Mm. Moreover, it's a world simulation that isn't faithfully and accurately tracking the mind-independent world. It is skewed by natural selection to uh, maximize the inclusive fitness of one's mm. genes. Uh, ranging from the fact that just as I live in a Dave Pierce centric uh, world simulation, I mean, each, each, each of us essentially is, 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 is the center of the universe, uh, that tends to follow us around. Uh, so it's not as though, yes, one is, has got this impartial, uh, godlike view from nowhere. And not just, uh, so-called second, Locke's secondary properties like colour, but even, uh, pri- Locke's primary, uh, qualities, uh, uh, if, if one actually takes science seriously, um, yeah, it's essentially our world, uh, our, our, our world simulations are not faithfully tracking the nature of, uh, properties, uh, recognised by mod- modern mm-hmm. physics. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, this this takes us yes, as I said, in, 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 into the nature of of of, of, of reality mm. and how faithful our world world simulations well, um, are. But by going for the hedonic recalibration, um, uh, one isn't taking a stance on this. I'm being I'm, I've been a, rather I'm simplifying that uh, uh, it's not strictly speaking the case that simply. You know, ratcheting up everyone's hedonic set points isn't going to change their behaviour and preferences in in all sorts of of ways. I think uh, eventually the nature of of transhuman and posthuman life will be incomparably more wonderful than a sort of squalid Darwinian life. But particularly with a conservative audience that is a is afraid they're going to lose something. Stressing the the, the conservatism, I, th- I think, is, is is worthwhile. You hear all kinds of, uh, I guess they're called theodicies, aren't they? In 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 uh, philosophy of religion, of you know, people trying to explain why God would allow suffering, and you need you hear ones like you need for real free will, you need the choice in good and evil, or you need to fall off your bike a few times to to you know soul build and make you a better bike rider. I'll give you this quote, and I'm sure you're familiar with it already from a, another famous existentialist. You want, if possible, and no if possible is crazier, to abolish suffering, the discipline of suffering of great suffering. Don't you know that this discipline has been the sole cause of every enhancement in humanity so far? There are problems that are higher than any problem of pleasure, pain or pity, and any philosophy that stops these is a piece of naivety. Um, How would you respond to to this uh yeah. Nietzsche, yes. Uh, <laughs> I know you're familiar with this one. Do you have any sympathy for Nietzsche here? No, I don't. Uh, Nietzsche, uh, uh, as well as absolutely frightful quotes <laughs> like the one you uh, gave, which sadly can be multiplied, yes. but uh, uh, nonetheless brilliantly witty, sometimes insightful, but nonetheless he said some truly frightful mm, things if you throw enough and darts. yes it's a it, it's it's a it's a, a vulgar misunderstanding to see Nietzsche as a proto-nazi and he despised anti-semitism nonetheless that there is abundant uh, material in Nietzsche that one can understand why it was 
is extremely congenial to uh, 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 the Nazis. Uh, and so, uh, yes, uh, uh, although I do know uh, one or two civilized uh, uh, Nietzscheans, uh, no, nonetheless, quotes like quote like like that r- remind one of just how frightful Nietzschean mm. philosophy is if 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 taken uh, d- taken okay. seriously. I mean, one one approach uh, is you know this kind of uh, inverting people's status quo bias is asking people mm. to imagine we encounter an advanced civilization that has got rid of suffering, predation, disease, depression, and so on, that live lives based on gradients of intelligent bliss. And what arguments would we we, we use to them to explain them why they should, uh, yes, revert to all the ghastly horrors of their ancestral uh, uh, past? Um, Could you take the example of football? Could you use that earlier yourself? You know, I... Uh, I supported t- as as a child. I played football for about ten years, and every weekend we lost ten, fifteen nil for my entire life. <laughs> and my parents standing on the sideline in the pouring rain, losing week after week after week. And it was only until a couple of years ago we actually um, actually won a, a, a I guess a streak of games and uh, and won a trophy, and that felt incredible. I'm not. That's not a uh, a weird flex. That's uh, that's a shameful fifteen years of me losing football matches. Um, but the point there is for football fans. They enjoy the suffering. They enjoy the pain. Like only one team wins the World Cup, but so many people watch it. And it feels good when they eventually get it. Is that you've got any sympathy for this view that one can enjoy suffering and enjoy pain? And there seems to be a, a, contra- a tension between these. Um, it's. I mean the. <laughs> The world is not simply divided into this continuum of uh, of good and bad states, that there are mixed mm. states. And uh, there is no one who enjoys unbearable despair or agony, but there are sadomasochists. There are people who uh, enjoy hot curries, nostalgia, all kinds of bittersweet uh, experience, uh, experiences. Um but in the case of something like you know, kind of masochism, which is the most perhaps uh, extreme example, certainly some forms of, of masochism, um, masochism triggers the release of intense, intensely uh, rewarding endogenous mm. opioids in some people. So it's not as though it undercuts the nature of the pleasure pain access uh, and the way that the pleasure pain access uh, uh, discloses the world's inbuilt metric of value and disvalue. And so, yes, people get uh, attached to various complex stimuli that are neither purely nice nor purely nasty um, and fetishize them, as I would say, see it uh, unduly. Um, Essentially, it's optional whether one decides to. I mean, something like nostalgia, mm. for instance, you know, bittersweet mm. feelings. If someone wants to continue feeling nostalgic, I mean, no one is going to force them to be happy. Mm. I mean, I think I don't always faithfully do this, but I think it's really important to stress we are talking about getting rid of involuntary pain, suffering, and misery, and that there is. No one out there who is going to come along and force you to be happy uh, to get rid of, 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 of what you value. It's a matter really of expanding choice and freedom. And for most people, pain, suffering, misery in all its guises uh, is, is, is not voluntary today. And we need to make it uh, 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 voluntary. In practice, and this is a tentative prediction, yes, we are going to get rid of all experience below hedonic zero and replace it by gradients of intelligent bliss. Um, But uh, like most uh, uh, predictions, this could be mistaken. Uh, And I would regard it as as, as quite far-fetched, this idea, this this coercive Mm. happiness that some people worry about. Mm. So what would you say to a sort... David, what would you say to sort of like a Francis Fukuyama type that says, well, look, our moral system is somehow grounded in our nature. There's something about us that, you know, is responsible for morality as the way it is, such that if we continuously modify our nature, that feature will be lost and thereby, 
you know, uh, the grounds of our morality would be lost. I mean, ultimately, I think uh, morality does derive from the pain-pleasure axis. Uh, And yes, if we were to retire one half of the axis and then ratchet up pleasure and well-being by orders of magnitude, yes, in one sense, we would be uh, radically alien. But in another sense, this is still conservative um rather than perhaps talking about gradients of super intelligent mm. bliss it can be useful to point to uh some of today's hedonic outliers people who are just naturally blessed with uh, extremely high hedonic set points extremely high pain uh, pain uh, uh, thresholds and uh yes focus on them rather than something that is too futuristic uh, and, and and far out Mm. Um, I mean, this, this is it. This, if one is some kind of essentialist and one considers it important to preserve species essence, whether mm-hmm. of humans or non-humans, it can get very theological uh, here. I mean, someone who says that ah, a, a lion that is not asphyxiating zebras and causing yeah. immense suffering is not truly a lion. And, well, I mean, you know, just uh, humans who start wearing clothes and go vegan, are we somehow not human? Are we violating our species' essence? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, and if we are, does it matter? I mean, it's... Uh... Well, I mean, that's it. it's interesting that you say that, David, because in when reading some of your stuff, you 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 make, like, quite a strong effort to kind of go... Hey, if you if you like believe this ethical theory, then you can be on board with the transhumanist project. If you believe this ethical theory, you can be on board with the transhumanist po- project. For instance, like say if you're Kantian or say if you're utilitarian. But what if you're you're like a kind of Aristotelian, right? You think that goodness is grounded in human nature, right? So to be good is to be a good rational animal, right? Something like that. And then if we move remove that animal nature. I mean, we can't be good anymore. I mean, that's that's kind of like a crude way to put it. But do you think, in in short, do you think sort of like virtue ethics is compatible with transhumanism? On on <laughs> depends what kind of virtue ethics. Yeah. I mean, it can be consequentialized virtue ethics. I'm generally mm-hmm. quite comfortable if I learn someone is a virtue ethicist, uh, the same way as I'm quite comfortable if I learn they're a Kantian, whereas if yeah. I know they're a, a, a hardcore utilitarian, well, how do I know they're, they're going to tell me the truth? <laughs> you you, you, you yeah. know, it, it's, it's complicated like mm-hmm. that. But uh, if, if someone says, yes, I'm a, a virtue ethicist and somehow this involves conserving uh, involuntary suffering uh, and I, yeah I would be yeah clearly opposed I mean one problem is um, you know one says words like pain and suffering and they've got this kind of faint whiff of something unpleasant but right now I'm not physically in pain I'm not clinically depressed I hope none of your uh, uh, listeners are either, and it doesn't sound uh, 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 too bad. But uh, yes, as one knows, if one is personally ever in severe pain, or one witnesses the severe suffering of a loved one, we're talking about something absolutely frightful. And unless we intervene on a genetic, biological level, then all forms of frightful suffering are going to persist. Indefinitely. Mm. Now that mm. may sound a bit like crude technical biotechnological determinism. It's not. Ultimately, one needs a kind of twin track uh, uh, strategy. It's not as though one is neglecting uh, a, a, a social reform. But uh, yeah, unless we actually uh, tackle the biology of suffering, then in 500 or 5,000 years' time, however, wonderful and civilized technologically the world will be uh, our counterparts will be sitting around saying why aren't we happy why why, why is there st- still so much uh, depression anxiety 
angst mm-hmm. in the world. So hopefully our listener questions jingle has just been played. If not, we still haven't created one, as the running joke goes. Uh, thank you to everyone who submitted a listener question. We're going to try and fly through as many as possible. David, if you could try and answer listener questions in, in 60 seconds or less, if that's if that's possible, to get through as many as we can. Um, don't worry if you if you do go over, but we'll try and fly through as many as possible. Um, Greg, do you want to kick us off with the first listener question? Okay, yeah. So, David, this this is from um, uh, Justin Kwong in the US. And Justin asks, what is the most promising thing that a young person should work on to forward the hedonistic imperative? Very much depends uh, on your skill base. Uh, I think perhaps the biggest obstacle is ethical, ideological. So if you can write or talk or brave enough to appear on a YouTube video, that would be fantastic. If you're more uh, scientifically oriented, uh, uh, for example, uh, the molecular signature of pure bliss is still unknown. It's been narrowed in rats to a cubic millimeter, scaled up to humans. That would be about a cubic centimeter. That would be uh, one thing to do. But um, yeah, if you're interested, do uh, 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 drop me a line and I would probably quiz you more about your background uh wonderful thank you for your question uh justin another question here from alex jordan uh, who i was actually the first person to ever donate to the podcast um alex jordan a long-time listener says hi guys big fan of the show my question would be how do you define suffering and what metrics quantitative or otherwise do or would you use to gauge which types of causes of suffering need to be addressed first? I'd like to see extreme hunger and thirst ended quite quickly. Well, completely agree with uh, ending uh, hunger and thirst. Um, there's the kind of semantic issue of what stage uh, does mere pain become outright suffering? Uh, that is conventional, not arbitrary. Uh, in the case of humans, we can verbalize uh, at least to some degree. In the case of uh, pre-linguistic uh, toddlers, non-human animals, uh, suffering can nonetheless be uh, operationalized, pleasure and pain. One can see how hard the uh, the toddler or the non-human animal will work to obtain or reward uh, a particular uh, noxious or enjoyable uh, 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 stimulus. Uh, and at least in the case of humans, one finds that uh, there is a congruence between, uh, yeah, verbal reports, behavior, uh, g- genetic and neurobi- neurobiological and microelectrode, uh, studies. Um, so sorry if that's a rather waffly, uh, answer. It's, it's, it, 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 it is important to quantify, uh, 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 suffering. But, uh, yeah, I think it can be done. Thank you, David. So there's another question here from our listener, Rach E. from France. And she says, David, you said back in 2015 that you were excited to see some transhumanist political parties on the scene in Europe. How are the public currently perceiving transhumanism, do you think? Oh, what a question. Um, And clearly... uh, Transhumanism is, as as a political movement, is not mainstream. Mm. Nonetheless, transhumanist uh, ideas are having an influence far more uh, widespread than the actual number of self-identified uh, 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 transhumanists. I mean, what should transhumanists be doing? Should we should we be aiming to get the other political parties to, so to speak, steal our clothes? Or should should we be uh, uh, aiming to, uh, to to launch our own political parties uh, across the mm. globe? Um, alas, I'm not psychologically uh, robust enough to participate in in any kind of very uh, active way. But hats off to uh, transhumanists uh, who want to actually turn uh, uh, fine words uh, into action. It can be yes, incredibly uh, thankless and unrewarding. It also calls for formidable uh, uh, skills of intelligence too. 
social Machiavellian intelligence. Uh, it might sound strange that a, a transhumanist would urge uh, Machiavellian intelligence, but sadly, if we're to claw our way out of the Darwinian abyss, it's going to need uh, sophisticated social skills, marketing mm. skills, uh, uh, and the like, so that we can create a civilization where Machiavellian intelligence is redundant. Another great answer there. We've got another no, question really. from someone in South Africa. I didn't realize uh, our audience was so strong. Ludwig Raoul asks two questions. He asks, one, how does he bridge the Isolt gap? And two, is David's reluctance to embrace the utilitarianium shockwave i'm definitely pronouncing that wrong david will be able to elaborate further he says maybe due to a failure of the imagination that is a failure to imagine just how blissful such an experience would be mm, yes two easy uh, questions to wrap up for you david <laughs> sorry the first one again sorry i was now i was got distracted thinking about the yeah, uh, two the second, attack the first, the first one was even easier it was how does he bridge oh, the, the is all, gap, yes ah yeah. <laughs> oh, right that i just uh, <laughs> I start uh, from the actual basic nature, perhaps plunge uh, your hand into ice cold mm. water, and there's this it's this combination of the is and the ought. There is this normative aspect that is built into the very nature of some kinds of experience. Mm. Now, this isn't going to impress uh, many mm. anti-realists who say that, sure, you're undergoing extremely disvaluable states, but they're not disvaluable mm. to me. But nonetheless, I would say that one shouldn't draw profound metaphysical truths from mere epistemological limitations and that taking a perspective uh, god's eye view god's eye super intelligence that could impartially access all first person perspectives from this intrinsically disvaluable state of ah this is agonizingly cold uh, uh, to actually do the collective equivalent of withdrawing from the ice cold water the hand of, of all sentient beings. Much, much more needs to be said, obviously, on bridging the, uh, the is ought gap. Uh, but yeah, it, it, in essence, uh, 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 that's the, the response. Um, in the case of the, of, of a utilitronium, uh, shockwave, um, yes, I mean, personally, once again, if there were a button, I would uh, mm. press it. Nonetheless, uh, arguing for you to the tronium shockwave uh, is likely to alienate uh, many people, uh, whereas going for a civilization based on gradients of intelligent bliss, uh, nonetheless, potentially, I think most people worldwide uh, can be won over. So, yes, though if one is a classical utilitarian, a utilitronium shockwave is ultimately incumbent on us. Nonetheless, uh, a world based on gradients of superintelligent bliss, perhaps surrounded by pure utilitronium, uh, isn't too bad. And a one final question here, and this comes from um, a German listener. Doesn't <laughs> matter nihilist, again. Uh, and he says, "What are they? Um, what are the top things, David, that you would like to uh, rewrite if you could from within the hedonistic imperative today?" Um, well, I wrote the hedonistic imperative back in 1995, mm. uh, and it was written in a rather kind of clotted academic style. This is when the the web was just beginning, and I had this, you know, this idea. Ah, one could actually reach mm. a wider audience. One didn't mm. need to think about what a publisher would would want, and so it was written in a rather uh, academic style that I tarted up a bit. Um, but uh, yeah, if if I could start from fresh, I would write it in a more accessible way, not for analytic uh, uh, philosophers. Uh, second uh, second way is simply that back in 1995, uh, the genome hadn't been decoded, uh, 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 gene drives hadn't been discovered. Uh, essentially, I would rewrite it to update it with the late latest scientific mm. advances. I mean, sadly, what I'm not able to do. One would hope that uh, 22, 20, oh, good heavens, 23, 24 years later that 
Wonder drugs, true designer drugs, uh, had been uh, invented. Actually, there's not been nearly as much progress in psychopharmacology as as one would wish. Um, but that's an issue. These are these are to some extent issues of of, of style, though. The kind of the core message that mm. uh, 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 suffering is technically optional, uh, and uh, that if we take uh, a longer term view, that we can uh, uh, get rid of, of suffering altogether. No, I, ha- I haven't radically changed my views. Wonderful. There. So thank you to everyone who submitted a listener question. Remember, if you have a listener question for one of our future guests, uh, whether they're a cyborg or a human being, then you could submit that on our website under the listener questions scheduled episodes drop down um david just before we wrap up we have a quiz with all of our guests known as pop pop philosophy quiz are you up for playing uh, <laughs> am i going to humiliate um, myself that's now normally the way no, normally we <laughs> i'm humiliated by um or greg rather would be humiliated by um you the guest normally getting most of the points Pop, 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 pop. Philosophy quiz. So you get a series of quotations from three different people, and you have to tell me which person it came from, and it's fastest person to answer. So I'm going to give you quotations. You've got to tell me who they're from, and we're playing David Pierce. So in the David corner, you've got quotes from David Brent, the BBC television character from the mockumentary The Office, portrayed by um, the director Ricky Gervais. You've got quotes from Pierce Brosnan, the Irish actor, um, who is best known perhaps for his performance of Richard in the hit 2013 film The Love Punch. And then you've got quotes from David Pierce, the negative utilitarian, vegan, transhumanist and the co-founder of Humanity Plus. So you've got to tell me whether it's from David Pierce or David Pierce. Any questions before we kick off? (laughs) It's new and it's different, and uh, though it'd be nice to say that as a transhumanist, I embrace change and exciting. I am trying to wrap my head around this. You'd be pleased <laughs> to know that all of your quotes are taken out of context as well, David, to make it extra easy for you. So the first quote is: uh, "It's technically feasible to build a thousand meter cube of tofu." Is that David Pierce or David Pierce? <laughs> Did I say this? You certainly did. That's one nil to you, David. That's it's okay. taken from yourself. I agree with Jordan Peterson. That's Pierce Brosnan. That's not Pierce Brosnan, unfortunately. Or fortunately, whichever way you look at it. David, you want to jump in here? Uh, oh, goodness heavens. Is this a Quora quote of... Uh, 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 <laughs> it is. You've got a super memory, in fact. That is a quote from one of your Quora answers. It's That's, probably uh, a nil. but or a however, yet... <laughs> Nonetheless, <laughs> despite uh... yeah, there's a few qualifications after I should note. That's two 0 to you, David. No one can escape life's pain. That's life. David Brent. That's not David Brent. David, do you want to have a stab? Who said this? <laughs> That's Pierce Brosnan. Yes. So no one gets ah, the, uh, the quote from that. Is this Pierce Brosnan that played James Bond? Yes, this is James oh, Bond. Okay. James Brosnan. <laughs> I realise how precious life is, probably because I've seen how it can be taken away. I would that... never say something like that. So, <laughs> is that Pierce Brosnan? Is that... Oh, Greg's there first. It is Pierce Brosnan. Oh, right, yes. If you can keep your head when all around you have lost theirs, then you probably haven't understood the seriousness of the situation. <laughs> That's David Brent. That's David Brent. I think that's all square at two all. (laughs) Eagles may soar high, but weasels don't get sucked into jet engines. David Brent. David Brent. That's 3-2 to Greg. We'll have a couple more before we finish. You think you can see a light at the end of the tunnel, but it's only some bugger with a torch bringing you more work. (laughs) Piers Brosnan. (laughs) That's not Piers Brosnan. That's David Brent again. We'll We'll play winner takes it all here. It's the ultimate goal every day you wake up to be happy. At the end of the week, you want to be happy. Happy in love, happy in work, happy in life, happy with yourself. It's pretty simple. The David Brent. It's not David Brent, which means David's got the chance to win the day today. Pierce Brosnan. David, it's Pierce Brosnan. (laughs) Well done. You've been shamed, Greg. You've been shamed. I thought this quiz was going to be the history of philosophy and I was... (laughs) Oh, no, right. (laughs) 
<laughs> You're pleasantly surprised. It is a, yes, no, yes, it's much yes. better than the history of philosophy. Um, right. Don't yeah, quote I, me on I, that I anticipate from life uh, uh, humiliation, you see, rather than reward. <laughs> so I'm, my, yes, my reward secretary is more geared to, to pain than pleasure. So, yeah, it was uh, uh, unexpected. <laughs> Concluding remarks. So we'll wrap up with some concluding remarks. I'll kick off if that's okay, Greg. I just want to thank you again, Dave, for joining us for the discussion today. I, um, as a, I'll say this towards the end of the discussion so you don't grill me on it, but as a classic utilitarian, I've, I found myself very on board with the, the transhumanist goal. Um, I think I, I, you know, I would like to work towards as well the abolitionist project. Um, my, my one hang up maybe is I'm skeptical that that people will also be on board, but perhaps because they want to conserve nature in the way that it is, um, which we haven't discussed in a lot of detail, but perhaps intuitively, they just seem, and it took me a while, even as a utilitarian, and you mentioned today that the utilitarian has some counterintuitive beliefs, and I certainly do, but the transhumanist one particular, it just has like this, this eerie feel about it. Um, but me and Greg were talking yesterday evening um, yesterday, weren't we, Greg, ahead of the interview? And we we're discussing, you know, in the past, people might have felt a gut-wrenching feeling about the abolition of, of slavery or or votes for women. And so perhaps this gut feeling against transhumanism isn't uh, very well founded. So I can't see any reasons why I shouldn't be a transhumanist. Uh, so for now, I'm, I'm happy, thanks to your work, to, to wear the label on my head. Oh, fantastic. So thank you, David. <laughs> Hmm. What are my concluding Frank. remarks and what will I go away and think about? Um, well, one of the things I really liked reading your work, David, and talking to you um, today is the kind of... Uh, the mixture of the kind of philosophy with the pragmatics of it. So like you said, like, yes, I would be an antinatalist or I would press the button, but no one will accept that. And I think that's like a quite an... I don't know, it's quite a like... It's, it's wise, it's interesting and it's you know it's it's nice to hear so i really enjoyed that um and something that i'll go away and think about i think is i would like to think how far the transhumanist project can or this kind of you know extending the moral sphere of concern can be can we extend it further to you know non-living entities or entities that can't suffer like how is the environment going to be impacted by kind of vaguely transhumanist projects so i think that's what i'll go away and think about more well uh, <laughs> thank you no thank you for being too uh, really uh, uh kind thoughtful sympathetic uh interviewers putting me at ease uh which is uh, much appreciated and uh, yes i hope both of you get to uh, savor uh, life based on gradients of super intelligent bliss <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode of the Pan Psychast. For more information on David Pierce and his work, you can visit the uh, www.abolitionist.com or www.hedweb.com. Links to both are in the iTunes description. You can also read his books, The Hedonistic Imperative, which in his maximum generosity, is super generous David has released for free, which is available on Kindle. And for 99 cents, and I highly recommend this one as something I've been looking at over the last few weeks uh, David's uh, collection of essays Can Biotechnology Abolish Suffering so we highly recommend picking up them and links are on our web and in the iTunes description as well and for links to all of our previous episodes if you're a new listener thepansycast.com is where you can find all of our previous episodes completely free get in touch with us on Twitter at the Pansycast at the Pansycast on Patreon thank you in particular to Lily Hooper David Ligeness Jim Clare and Mr. T. And very special thank you to Westland Endowment and Colum St. Gabriel's for supporting the show as well. Thank you. You've been listening to the wonderful, soothing voices of Dr. Gregory Miller. Thank you for listening. David Pierce. Thank you. <laughs> thank you once again. <laughs> and me, Jack Symes. Thank you for listening. That was excellent. Thank you, David. Cut. <laughs> yeah. Can I now relax? <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm about to say anything terribly incriminating, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs>